Turn with me to John chapter 14, verse 3. We've been talking about the end time events. John chapter 14, verse 3. One of the great promises that Jesus gave us at the end of his ministry, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. He's coming back. He's coming back. That's a promise of God to us, the church. He's coming for his bride. He's coming for the church. He said, if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then at the very closing of Scripture, way back in Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, I'm, uh, this is like the last verse, at the very, uh, second to last verse at the end of Scripture. He says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And we say amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. He's coming back, hallelujah. And he's coming back quickly, praise the Lord. Now, last Sunday, we talked about his return being called the blessed hope. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says that we should be looking for the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the church, the blessed hope and glorious appearing or return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm looking. Are you looking? The Bible says we should be looking. I'm looking. Are you? He's coming back. Well, the rapture is a supernatural event that is going to catch the church away off of this earth where gravity no longer has hold of you, but you're going up. Because the Bible says that he, the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a shout. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. With the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. I want you to know that the shout of heaven, that our Lord's shout will reach into the realms of the dead. Oh, their spirit is already with the Lord, but their body needs to be drawn back together again I don't care how long that body's been in the grave I doesn't make any difference God will pull those molecules back together again and he will form a glorified body the dead will rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up and that word caught up is where we get the Latin word rapture will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's coming back with a shout, with a trump. Dead are going to be raised up. Their bodies have got to catch up with their spirits, which are already in heaven. Our bodies are going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This body is going to become glorified. Hallelujah. Come on, say amen. amen. Your body, no more aches and pains, no more headaches. No, come on, say amen. amen. You're going to have a glorified body. Turn to a neighbor and say, you're going to be so good looking. <laughs> yeah, you are. We are. We're going to be a handsome group, praise the Lord. We're going to get our glorified body. Our body is going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, tells us in the first letter to Corinthians, and we're going up to meet the Lord in the air. And my glorified body is going to pass right through that ceiling. <laughs> Nothing's going to hold us down. Nothing's going to hold us down. If you're a born-again believer, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are going up in the rapture. There is nothing that is going to hold you down. You're going to receive your glorified body. You're going to leave this earth behind. You're going to meet the Lord in the air. Glory to God. We're going to be forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. I think that's why they call this good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, 
In Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, it reads, And behold, I am coming quickly. Everybody say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And my reward is with me. Say, Praise the Lord. Praise to give to everyone according to his work. Praise the wait a second. To give to, oh my goodness. To give to everyone according to his work. We will receive rewards according to the work in this life. Now, this takes us to the next stage of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ begins with the rapture of the church. And then, when the church is raptured, and we leave this earth behind, and now we're in the glory, glorious presence of God in heaven, now we visit the Lord Jesus Christ at what's called the judgment seat of Christ, or the bema of Christ. The Bible says that he's coming quickly, thank God. And he's coming with rewards to give to everyone according to his work. As your pastors, Debbie and I want you to know, there will come a time where every born-again, believing Christian will stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. We must tell you this. It's good news. Don't worry. It's good news. But the day will come when every single one of us will stand before the Lord. Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Turn to a neighbor and say, I hope he uses a lot of scripture today. <laughs> because I love the word. Love Romans chapter 14, verse 10. We'll look down to verse 13 as well. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, so let each of us, each of us, every one of us individually, let each of us shall give account of himself to God. And therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be pleasing, to be well-pleasing to him. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the judgment seat of Christ has ominous connotations to it because it has the word judgment in it. And we usually when we think of judgment, we think of punishment. In fact, there are some scholars that look at the judgment seat of Christ and they see it as a place of great sorrow. Some look at it as even a place of terror. But I believe the Bible gives us a greater revelation than that. The bema, or judgment seat, the original Greek word is bema, we translate it judgment seat, was a place in ancient times where a king would sit in judgment and pass judgment over those who would come before him. But that's not how Paul uses it in Scripture. Paul relates it back to the original connotation of bema, which has to do with athletic events. The Bema seat is the place where an athlete would come after he has won his athletic contest and they would put him up on the Bema or the platform and they would put the medal upon him and the crown upon him. So the Bema or the judgment seat was a place of reward for the athlete who has won the race. Say that's me. Yeah, it is. I've been watching the, 
the uh, Olympics a lot. Have you seen them? They're on all night. You can watch them all night. And, and I, love, I love the Olympics. And as I was reading this passage, because the, uh, in fact, you can look with me to 2 Timothy 2 and 5. It says, if anyone competes in athletics, and Paul used the example of athletics all the time. He says, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned. He does not visit the bema or the judgment seat unless he competes according to the rules. There, in the bylaws of the Olympics, it says you've got to do three things. You've got to have an opening ceremony, you've got to have a closing ceremony, and you have to have award ceremonies in between. And accordingly, all of the athletic events have to be judged by officials to make sure those who are competing in the athletic events are doing it according to the rules. Have you noticed in watching the Olympics that there is many umpires, referees, judges as there are athletes? In fact, there's people to make sure if you're running that you're staying in your lanes. Or if you're jumping, you don't jump over the line. Or if you're serving a ball, it doesn't go outside the court. If you're doing flips in gym gymnastics, you stay within the little square. Or if you're in Greco-Roman wrestling, you stay inside the little circle. I mean, there is judges that are checking everything all the time to make sure everybody's playing by the rules. Why? Because not everybody plays by the rules. I was watching a, a soccer tournament, gold medal tournament between the United States. Yay! I'm telling you, there's some sports. I don't even know what the sport is, but if the United States is playing, I'm all about that sport. Come on, say amen. I was watching one sport. I said, I don't even know what this is. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. But it, the USA is in it. Go, go, go. Well, anyways. We were playing uh, Japan, and Japan had beat us last time at the World Games. And so this is, a, this is like a, a rematch, uh, so to speak. And our girls, they, they, get, they get a special kick, and our girls are lined up, and they want to kick it past our girls into the net. And, uh, and apparently, apparently, one of our girls did something that she shouldn't have done. She lifted her arm out or put her elbow or something and blocked the ball the way she should not have blocked the ball. And, and somebody said that in the announcer's booth. She, oh, she shouldn't have done that. I said, hush. I'm talking to the television now. I said, hush. She did not do a thing wrong. That looked okay to me. She's fine. Y'all just, just be quiet until they did the replay in slow motion. And then I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. We got away with something. We got away with something. But they have, they have uh, uh, photo finishes now. Because everything comes down to a hundredth of a second, you understand. It, it's photo finishes. And if you don't agree with one judge, you can appeal to another judge. And they look at the video again to see who's right and who's wrong. We had one of our girls competing in uh, gymnastics. And she just missed... Uh, receiving a bronze medal in her event because of, of the scores of the judges. Well, one of the, uh, what's, what's that guy, Bella Caroli, Bella something? Yeah, thank you all so much. This, uh, um, Bella, he's up in the stands, and he shouts down to her coach. He says, contest it, contest it. You all see that? Yes. Contest it. They got it wrong. And the coach said, contest what? He didn't know what he was talking about. But Bella saw something he didn't see. He said, go contest it. And so he did. He wrote something down, took it to the judges. They looked at the videotape, and they saw in the videotape, they did not award that young lady enough points for the difficulty of her exercise. And she went from fourth place to third place and got the bronze medal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The judgment seat of Christ is looking at how we compete in this life so that we can receive the proper credit for all things done by the Spirit. Somebody say amen. 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 Now, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment of sins, you understand, because Jesus has already died for our sins. In Christ, we have already been judged. In Christ, we have already been uh, crucified. 
In Christ, we have already died. In Christ, we've already been resurrected. So when we stand in the judgment seat before Jesus Christ, we are not going to be judged for our sins. My sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Nobody's bringing those up again, praise the Lord. But what I will be judged for will be my works. And this is where the judgment seat of Christ can hold some sorrow. Even though it may be momentary sorrow, because our tears are wiped away. Amen? But this is where the judgment seat of Christ really stirs in my heart this morning. And this is what I want to convey to the body of Christ this morning. Look with me very quickly in 2 John verse 8. John tells us to look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we have worked for, that we may receive a full reward. That we do not lose those things that we have worked for. Now I'm going to explain this in just a second, but this is a very sobering revelation. There is a possibility of great reward at the beam of Christ. There's a possibility of a loss of reward at the beam of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, you have to see this. In 1 Corinthians 3, we're going to get further revelation. Quickly turn there, because you're going to want to underline it. 1 Corinthians 3, turn to your neighbor and say, hurry up, hurry up, turn. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. That's right, you don't want your neighbor to lose anything, do you? No. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Now we're going to look how we're going to build our lives, our ministries, our efforts uh, correctly. According as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid other than Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stone, wood, hay, straw. Verse 13. Let each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. There is a trying fire, a testing fire at the judgment seat of Christ where our lives will be exposed to this, uh, this examination by divine fire. And the fire is going to be applied. It doesn't make any difference whether it's gold or silver or precious stone or whether it is wood, hay, or stubble. It's still fire being applied. The difference is in the work that it is testing. The testing is the same for everyone. There is no respect of persons. There is no difference. The testing is the same. Are the works different? That's the question. Well, there's works of gold. There's works of silver. There's works of precious stone. But then sadly, there are flammable works, works of wood and, and hay and straw. Well, gold exposed to fire just becomes more pure, shinier. Silver exposed to fire just becomes more shiny. Precious stones exposed to fire, no effect whatsoever. It just brightens them up. But wood exposed to fire turns to ashes. Hay exposed to fire turns to ashes. Stubble exposed to fire. Straw turns to ashes. Nothing's left. It's all gone, you understand. So the 
fire then reveals, it makes it clear, it declares it. In other words, when the judgment of God, when His eyes looks upon the work of man and the Spirit of God examines those, those uh, works of His life, we will not debate it. It will be absolutely clear. We will have absolute understanding that the judgment is righteous. If the work burns to ashes, we'll say, we won't say, Lord, you got that wrong. There's no judge to appeal to. We'll be in absolute agreement, Lord, you're right. That was a mess. You're right, Lord. Wood, hay, stubble, no doubt about it. Yeah, burn it up, Lord. But it will be loss. In Romans 8 and 1, it says, Now, therefore now, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is a war within the life of the Christian. The Christian experience is marked by war. The war is between your flesh or carnal nature and your spirit man. The flesh or carnal nature is motivated and dominated and directed by the things of this world. Your spirit nature is motivated, directed, and dominated by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. But both these natures live on the inside of you. One wants to build a life, a ministry, a work of wood, hay, and stubble. The other wants to build a life of gold and silver and precious stones. But there's a war going on. What happens, though, when we yield to the flesh, we want it to look like gold. When we yield to the wood, we want it to look like silver. When we yield to the straw, we want it to look like precious stones. So how do we do that? We dress it up. You can dress up the flesh to look very spiritual. We call that religion. You can have all sorts of ritual and ceremony and pomp and circumstance so that it looks as spiritual as it possibly can. But really, once you get past the facade, because the facade, oh man, it's all polished and painted and gleaming and it looks great, but on the inside, just under the skin, is nothing but hay and straw. It, there's no structure to it. There's no life to it. It. There's no precious qualities to it. No, behind the facade is just a flesh. It's just flesh. There's a, um, a heartbreaking story of uh, a great Olympic athlete. She competed at the Sydney Olympics. She was a a track star. Her name was Marion Jones, and she was fantastic. She probably won, won uh, I think, like six medals. Fastest woman alive, and, and um, everybody wondered, how, how is she so fast from a young age? How is she so fast? Well, after she won all those gold medals, her husband, who was also in the Olympics, he was a shot putter, uh, he confessed to having taken steroids. And uh, the spotlight turned to her. And she denied it, and she denied it, and she denied it until she could not deny it any longer. And then she confessed that she had been taking steroids for years. And as a result of that, they took all of her medals away, and she ended up in prison for six months. You can win all the races and look like a track star and a gold medal winner and win the acclaim of the world and everybody look at you and say you are the fastest person on planet earth aren't you awesome 
But underneath that facade, you know it's all fakery. It's all drug enhancement. It's not real. It's a lie. And eventually, when the judge finds out, he's going to come back and say, you did not get those medals legally. You cheated to get them. Someone else should have them. I'm going to take them away from you. You do not deserve them. When we build a life, I don't care if it's a ministry. I don't care what it is. But if it is true, Truly, at its heart, a work of the flesh. It doesn't make any difference how tall the steeple is out front. It doesn't make any difference what the, what the denomination is called, how long it's been around. I don't care. God's going to look at it and say, hey, wait a second. Is this thing nothing more than flesh dressed up? Or is it birth of the Spirit? Filled with the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, alive by the Spirit. There are huge ministries that are nothing more than a facade dressed up that will one day face a test of fire and there's not going to be any question or doubt or debate or it's going to simply be oh Lord we could have did it right but we thought we could do it by the flesh and do it a little bigger and a little grander and a little quicker Listen to ourselves rather than listening to you. And it's nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble. Those who think they get away with something ultimately will not. You say, well, how do I know if I am going to lose my work or put my whole heart into something? Follow with me. I'm going to share that with you. What is subject to the refiner's fire? Well, everything. Our character, our words, our works, our attitudes, our motives, our ministries, our callings, our gifts, our love walk. It's all subject to the refiner's fire. In Colossians 3 and 23, it says, Whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who does wrong will be be repaid for what he has done. There is no partiality with God. I want to talk in closing about the rewards, and then I want to sew up a few thoughts here. There are great promises of rewards at the Bema Seat of Christ. This is the good news. The promise is, in Matthew 6, that we can lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. There are promised treasures in heaven. Turn to a neighbor and say, that's good news. The promise is, in Matthew 25, that we receive great commendations from the Lord. In Matthew 25, he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The promise is that we will receive crowns in glory. There's the uncorruptible crown for faithfulness. There's the crown of exaltation or rejoicing for witnessing and ministry to others. There's the crown of life given for enduring trials and tribulation. There's a crown of righteousness for the faithful use of the gifts and loving His appearance. There's the crown of glory given to elders for faithfully shepherding the flock. Turn to a neighbor and say, you're going to look good with a crown. You know what we're going to do with all our crowns? We're going to cast them at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's going to give them to us. We're going to cast them right back at His feet as we're worshiping Him and praising Him. There's a promise that He says that we will rule and reign with Him. 
He's going to make us ruler over many things. In fact, it says in Matthew 24 and 47, I say unto you that I will make him ruler over all my goods. Isn't that awesome? Okay. Here's the deal, and I'm closing on this. How do you know in your works what will stand the test of the trial by fire? Well, when we stand before the Lord, the Bible says that fire will test our works. But John the Baptist said way ahead of that, he says that Jesus is going to give a gift to the church. He says, I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me, I'm not worthy to carry a shoe or to tie a shoelace. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The same judgment that we will face at the Bema Seat of Christ is the judgment that we have in our hearts right now. Because the Holy Spirit, because we're baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire, the Holy Spirit is constantly speaking to us when we get, or get ready to build something by the flesh. The Holy Spirit says, uh-uh-uh, that won't stand. Go with the Spirit. Do you all understand that? In Luke 3 and 16, he says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. This is why Debbie and I adamantly teach the benefits of the Spirit-filled life. Because in this life now, while the Holy Spirit is ministering to us, this is where we get it all sorted out. If we start to lean toward the flesh, the Spirit says, no, lean back. If we start to build a life on wood, hay, or stubble, the Spirit says, no, lean back. Lean into the Spirit. Lean into the Spirit so that we can work it out in this life and not have to wait to the beam of seat. You all understand that? Do you get that? Revelations 22, and George, you can come. Revelations 22 and 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I give to everyone according to his work. What God wants to impart to us is rewards. What I want to see in your life is that there would be great rewards for a spiritual life well lived. Are you ready for that? Yes. Did you receive anything out of this today? Yes. Will you stand with me this morning?